This is something I really want to talk about to be sure that everyone is cautious and stays level headed at all times. Now for the context, I live in the middle of nowhere Canada. It was an old town that had quite a few abandoned buildings due to the absence of residents. Me and my friends were tired of the lack of entertainment options, so we began exploring these abandoned buildings. Prior to the experience I'm about to talk about, we never had anything too crazy happen to us. Occasionally we'd see a small bit of blood like liquid, and we saw a few pentagrams on the ground from someone who went to the house previously, but nothing too bad until the last time I'd gone exploring abandoned buildings. When I was younger, I used to go to a daycare that was part of a mental hospital. It's a weird combination I know, but it closed down due to a lack of patients and a lack of children at that daycare. So, I decided to go back there with my friends a few years ago. I was 15 when this happened, and most of my friends were around the same age. Upon arriving, it was rather cliche. There was fog, it was rather dark, and the rain was drizzling outside. We went to the main gate which was padlocked shut. We decided to help each other hop over it and making a ton of noise. We were laughing and giggling the whole time, unsuspecting of what was to come. We looked around the small play place park with flashlights that we had on our persons. Even with those somewhat powerful flashlights, our visibility was still rather limited. We decided to enter the decaying building now. Glass and dirt crunched under our feet as we stepped into the daycare section of that complex. There were still old Legos and wood chips from previous furniture. Old torn dolls and toys strewn about. The further we walked around the daycare section, we naturally became more and more silent until all we could hear was the crunch of the dirt beneath our feet. I found some crayons in a plastic container in the corner of the room and I walked over to pick them up when all of a sudden we heard a loud crash coming from behind a metal door leading to the psych ward part of the building. My friends and I all looked at one another. As a whole, we were a group of five. Most of them were very bold and cocky. My friend Brian suggested we go and look to see where that sound came from. Personally, I wasn't too fond of the idea, but with my group of friends, there was no way anyone was going to decline such a thing. We all stacked up on the door and opened it. It was rusted to the floor and we heaved to get it open. As we walked inside, the metallic smells became stronger with the hint of something else which I couldn't quite put my finger on in the moment. As we walked in, our flashlights pointed in every direction with Brian leading the group. The hallways were tight and to the left and right were occasional metal doorways, some with open doors, some with not. I felt slightly claustrophobic and began feeling a little hard to breathe. We continued. Brian shone his flashlight into a room and recoiled. We all stopped walking as Brian slowly entered the room. What is it? I asked him. I thought I saw someone in here, but it seems fine now. To be honest, I thought he was just messing with us to increase our anxiety in the moment. But looking back, I think he really did see someone and was being completely honest. He backed out of the room and we continued walking deeper into the psych ward. When another friend swiftly told us to stop, we came to a halt and all listened. In the distance ahead of us, we heard the subtle pitter-patter of footsteps echoing through the hallway. We all looked at each other, fear in every one of our eyes. Brian continued walking toward the sounds, and we considered turning back for a second without Brian, wondering if some ghost or something was inside the building. Obviously, we couldn't do that to him, but the closer we got, the more I felt like I was being watched. When we finally entered a room on the right, which had the smell of rotting meat, laying in front of us was a dead deer. Its innards were spilled all over the floor, staining the concrete. One of my friends had a very weak stomach and immediately vomited all over the floor. That's when we heard it, whispering from somewhere. Brian shone his flashlight into the corner of the room, where a man with short hair was standing with his head down. He wore a bright green t-shirt, stained with what I assume was blood, and had torn beige pants on. He did not have any socks, and his feet seemed to be damaged. He was twitching sporadically, and continued to mumble, even after we saw him. 
We were all frozen, staring at him for I'd say a solid 30 seconds before he made his first true movement. He looked up at us with this haunting grin that still sends shivers down my spine. You guys here for the feast? He said with each word varying in inflection and energy. This kicked us all over the edge and we bolted out of that room all the way back to the daycare center. The door was still open. We decided to try and slam it shut, but the rust and the pure weight of the door almost kept it open. It took three of us, pulling with all of our strength to close it. And just before we did, we could see the silhouette of that man watching us. His teeth being the only other human feature that I could see. We sat behind that metal door, catching our breath for a second, looking at one another for confirmation that we all saw the same thing. After a little bit of labored breath from each of us, we heard a light tapping on the door, and that's when we decided it's time to leave. We booked it out of that vicinity and ran home. A year after we visited that spot, police went back due to a routine search of the area and found that same man. It was stated that this guy used to go to the psych ward before it closed down. He somehow escaped that facility that he was transferred to. He'd been living in the wild all around that complex. The cops brought him in. He had a series of diseases and sickness from eating raw meat. His mental condition was much worse than before. There were also future rumors that he did kill someone in the forest while searching for food, but none of that has actually been confirmed. In the end, guys, be careful, especially in dangerous areas such as abandoned buildings. And creepy dude, let's not meet. I have never shared this story except, strangely enough, to my teacher at the time. I was in first grade at Northside Elementary in DeSoto, Texas. We lived about three long blocks down, as my mother liked to call it. I personally feel like it was a lot more. My sister and I were brought to school on a regular basis and would walk home. My parents decided to divorce at this time. My dad moved out and we started seeing him every other weekend. My mother began dating someone else, and I remember she no longer became interested in taking us to school as much. She became very preoccupied with her new relationship, and I remember that she often had me walking to school, as well as coming home. Thinking back now, I'm not sure why I was late. There might have been a doctor appointment or something. I also remember that it wasn't very late at all, maybe just an hour or so after school started. My mom pulled up in the car, and I got out hoping that she would wait there to watch me go up to the flight of the stairs and inside, but she drove off right away, to my dismay. This is when I saw him, a man, pretty normal looking, stepped out of a car looking directly at me. My mom had pulled off, and this man was the only person around now. He crossed the street quickly, at an angle, coming directly toward me. I remember turning and running up the steps. There were three flights of stairs with landings in between, and when you're a little girl, these stairs seemed so much bigger. I remember looking over my shoulder as he was literally running up the stairs after me. Even at that age, I had a horrible gut reaction as I ran as fast as I could. I remember the double doors in front of me as I was panicked, thinking I wouldn't make it. Even at that young age, I felt the energy coming from this otherwise normal looking person who looked just like a dad. I remember the huge intrinsic feeling of doom and urgency to get to these doors. As I did, I immediately turned around and saw him, standing on part of the second stairs. He just stood there looking at me as I looked at him from the inside. Then he looked extremely frustrated, turned, and walked back away to his car. I remember telling my teacher about it. Then maybe a week or so later, a police detective showed up to interview me about what had happened. This makes me really think that it was connected to something that happened around that area at the time. I don't think I've ever been that afraid in my life. It was a powerful internal fear. It was like my body told me to just run. A few years ago, 
I was renting a house in Northern California. The neighborhood was just outside the suburbs. It seemed like the perfect balance of having space and having nice neighbors close enough to not feel isolated. The area had no street lights, so it was very dark at night, especially if there were clouds blocking the moonlight. That didn't really bother me though. It made my little house feel even more quaint on those dark nights. I get home from work one day in midwinter. It was a cloudy night, so I pulled up to my house and saw only what my headlights and front porch light illuminated. When I got out of the car, I caught a whiff of cigarette smoke. That was odd, as I'd never smelled that around the house before, and I didn't see anyone nearby, but I ignored it and went inside. I had just gotten off a shift with a few hours of overtime, so I was pretty tired, even though it wasn't even 7 p.m. yet. I decided to take a shower and call it a night. I woke up sometime in the middle of the night, sure that I heard a noise inside my house. I wasn't worried right away because my friend would sometimes stop by to use my shower after work on his way to his night classes. I had even given him a spare key so that he could stop by if I wasn't home. He would always text me to let me know beforehand though, and I hadn't heard my phone go off. I reached over my bedside table and picked up my cell phone to see if my friend had sent me a text. The bright light from my phone screen and the number pad blinded me. Those were the days before phones had a light sensor that would dim the screen in the dark. And this particular phone was so bright that I could use it as a flashlight. Through squinted eyes, I could make out that it was 9 something, but I couldn't tell if I had an unread text or not. I set my phone aside and called out my friend's name. There were a couple of seconds of silence before I heard loud footfalls as someone started running through the bottom floor of my house. I leapt out of bed and ran to the closet. They were already up the stairs by the time I'd opened up the door and stepped inside. The house had three rooms upstairs, two bedrooms on either side of the hallway, the one I was in, and a spare, then a bathroom at the end. The bedroom doors were both closed, but the bathroom door was cracked open. I heard whoever in my house thunder down the hallway, past my door, and into the bathroom. Thank God he did that. That gave me enough time to open the attic access in the ceiling of my closet and hoist myself up. I had just started to lift myself up when the person ran back out of the bathroom. My feet were barely inside my attic when my bedroom door burst open. I heard footsteps run into my room and then stop. When they didn't see me in that room. They ran back to the hallway and into the other room, which had boxes stacked in a corner, some weights, and a table where I painted my miniature models. I guess they decided that if someone were hiding, it would be in the bedroom because they charged back into my room and turned on the light. A moment later, the closet door was ripped open. I was crouched in my attic, just a foot or so away from the access, so I could try to stop them if they started to climb up. From my vantage point, all I could see was from about their knee down. They were wearing dirty blue jeans with frayed cuffs and worn work boots. After a few seconds of looking in the closet, I stepped away and I heard a loud crash come from my room, followed by a scream of frustration and anger. That scream was the most unnerving part of the incident for me. It reminded me far too much of my stepfather, who would scream in a similar way when he lost his temper. He would eventually be put in a mental hospital for severe mental disorders that resulted in erratic and violent tendencies. The man in my house ran back down the stairs. I heard crashes and clatters as things were thrown around and furniture was knocked over. I stayed crouched in the attic. I had left my cell phone when I ran for the closet, and I wasn't certain I could climb down without him hearing. After some time, the noises stopped. I started counting slowly. When I reached a thousand, I decided it was safe enough to climb down and call the police. The first thing I noticed when I exited the closet was the intruder had flipped over my bed. I assume in an attempt to find me. That was the loud noise I had heard after he stepped away from the closet. Couldn't find my cell phone, so I went to the landline by the bed and called the police. I waited in my room until I heard them call out from downstairs. The first floor was a complete mess, but I had expected that. Chairs had been knocked over. The sofa had been flipped. All the books, pictures, and knickknacks I had on my shelves were strewn all over the floor. 
The cupboards in the kitchen had been opened and all the boxed and canned foods had been thrown to the ground. As far as I can tell though, the only thing missing was a single knife out of the wooden block in my kitchen. The police checked the house from bottom to top. They found the side door had been forced open by something like a crowbar. They also found a few cigarette butts along my fence line with some foil and an empty pen tube, which the police said people often use to smoke meth. So they think he'd been watching my house for quite a while. I realized that he must have been out there smoking a cigarette when I got home. They collected up the evidence and told me I should stay with family or friends that night and get that door fixed as soon as possible. I opted to just not sleep. I moved the shelf over to the block of the broken door and spent the next couple of hours cleaning things up. I would often go to the window with the flashlight and shine it along the fence line where the police found those cigarette butts and foil, but I didn't see anything. The next day I called to have the door fixed and the motion lights installed at the back sides of my house. I ran a phone cable up into the attic and added a landline. I never wanted to be stuck up there without a phone again. Nothing else happened at that house though, and I lived there for another three years without incident. One more precaution I took was practicing getting out of my bed, going to my closet, and climbing into the attic as quickly and as quietly as possible. I even kept at it when I moved, except now I go to a crawl space at the back of the closet instead of the attic. I try not to think about what would have happened if I'd been a bit slower getting in there, or if he hadn't gone to the bathroom at the end of the hall first. This is my first time posting here or anywhere. I want to recount a bizarre series of events from my childhood and figured this was the best place to do it. When I was a kid, I lived in Clinton, Tennessee. Both parents worked full time, so I was often sent over to stay with my grandparents who had a plot of land in the vicinity of, but not right in, Mossheim, near Greenville. Both of them had been in East Tennessee their entire lives, and that area, for a good many years. They'd been established at their home for some decades before this story, and remained there for a while after. Recently, I had a reason to return to the area in Tennessee, after spending the majority of my life in Minnesota. Being in and around the area, driving the same roads, made me reminiscent about my lazy summer days tucked away at my grandparents' house. Learning to shoot with that same 22, which my grandpa had taught my mom, feeding fish at a neighbor's stocked pond, or spotting deer and bear with binoculars from the front porch. When I relayed this to my mom, she in turn told me a story about a time I scared my grandpa half to death, then lied about hanging out with Bigfoot. At first, I had no idea what she was on about. Then I remembered exactly what had happened, and it started to clarify. New context given by the experience adulthood provides. And no, this is not about Bigfoot or a cryptid. Before we start, some information about my grandparents' land. Their house was on a small hill surrounded by a grass lawn. The lawn gave way to a smallish hayfield, then to the wood line. Those woods lasted for a good half mile on either side of the house, and a good several miles to the back. I hated the hayfield because it was too pokey to play in but liked to hang out in a creek that ran behind it. To get there, I would walk the edge of the property, just in the wood line to avoid the hay, while at my grandparents the only rules were that I stay where I could see the house, so the house could see me. I was to take a whistle with me anywhere I went as well. I didn't take that whistle, seeing it as a badge of my regrettably young age, and the best part of the creek was out of sight of the house. That was the only stretch where it got deeper than my knees and thus, the only part where I could swim. Naturally, I spent much of my time in that water splashing around, skipping stones, and just being a kid. One day, I was playing in the creek when I noticed someone. It was a man, a stranger, on the bank watching me. He had long hair, a beard, and pale skin so dirty it was stained. I could not tell his age, and just simply thought of him as old. I have no better guess now, as he clearly went through long years of hard living. He wore no shirt, no pants, only a wrap of dirty cloth around his waist that I thought of as a Moses dress, thanks to some illustrated Bible books. Around his neck, 
There were multiple necklaces made from knotted tatters of cloth, fiber, and string. In these knots were various pieces of detritus, mostly bones, but some flowers and bits of dark glass. When I first saw him there by the creek, I was terrified, frozen still. The man, however, was smiling. He gestured from his squat with an outstretched arm, fingers down, in a kind of, don't stop for me, kind of wave. I didn't react. I was startled, reeling. Then he splashed at me, still smiling. Then he did it again, and I splashed back. Soon, we were playing. We both threw water at each other. He jumped into the creek and stomped around with me, laughing all the while. He threw rocks into the water. So did I. I pushed him. He pushed me back. We carried on for some minutes, until my grandma called for me. With her voice, a switch had flipped. The man stopped in his tracks, gaze fixed backward toward the house. As my grandma kept hollering, he looked at me, and he crept back to his side of the creek, barely disturbing the water, then slid into the bush, completely silent the whole way, all while holding my gaze. Once he was out of sight, I waited in the water until my grandma found me. She wanted to know if I was alone, and I said no. She became very tense, asking who was with me while looking around. I didn't answer, I didn't know how. Seeing no one, she pulled me back to the house without any more words, gripped like iron the whole time. At the house, the real inquisition began. I didn't really have new words. The event and this reaction overwhelming my ability to explain. Such silence further irked my grandma, and I was swiftly placed in a corner, held without bail, awaiting judgment. An hour later, my grandpa came home from work. He was told about my churlishness and was ready to set into me again when I started talking. I told him about the man, hairy and old, dressed like Moses, how we played and then he disappeared. I remember they digested this for a few minutes before sending me to my room. I was happy to go, and happier still, Grandpa did not yell like he usually did when I misbehaved. Later, I was brought out for dinner. I ate in the kitchen with Grandma, but Grandpa called me to the back porch. He was on the swinging bench, looking out over the hayfield, turned red by the setting sun. He had kicked off his boots and then put him next to his shotgun. I knew that this was odd for the gun to be out of the closet. Previously, we'd used it to shoot bottles. Some, I would throw them into the air like they were clay pigeons. These escapades were accompanied with speeches about how the gun was dangerous and only for adults to use. He went through my story again, his tone deadly serious, and eventually, he asked me how hairy was the man, really. I told him very thinking this was the right answer, and he asked where. I told him everywhere, like a bear. He ruminated on this, and I grew more nervous, worried I was in trouble or causing trouble. I just want the trouble, wherever it lie, to end. So when he finally asked me to swear, in the name of Christ and on my mother that I was telling the truth about everything, I said I'd been joking. He finally yelled then, and sent me back to my room. The family memory became that I had hid by the creek and made up a tale about Bigfoot. At the time, everyone was upset with me, and I was forbidden from going back to the creek or anywhere out of sight. The enforcement of this rule, like the others, was lackluster. Even so, for a time I didn't go back to the creek. In my memory, I stayed away for a very long time, but I'm sure it was only a few days. That hiatus feeling interminable to my elementary age self, when I did start going back to the creek, I took a bucket of toys, and a thick stick plucked from the woodline on the way. I think I was conflicted about what to do if that man came back, imagining either impressing him with my toy collection or clubbing him, or both in turn. When he did show back up, he appeared to me as I dozed under a tree off the side of the creek. I was once again gripped with terror. He was not smiling this time, his face expressionless as he lurked beside me, having watched for who knows how long before I smelled him. I scrambled away, leaving my stick and toys behind. Coming to my feet a yard out, I stood out in the sun while the man watched me from the shade. Eventually, he crouched, 
and started to look through my bucket. I remember becoming indignant as he examined my toys one by one, only to toss them into the dirt. It became too much, and I started to lecture the man, telling him how he got me in trouble, how he's a weirdo, how he stank. At some point, he stopped looking through my things and calmly watched my tirade, face still neutral, eyes analytic. Once I'd concluded with my lecture, I sat back under the tree to pout, having become hot in the sun. I remember the man made a noise, a grinding kind of snort, when I looked over at him. He was chuckling while he inspected the last few figures in my bucket. I wanted to laugh too, but it was more determined to stay sullen. Once everything was out of that bucket, he put one figure, Ghidorah, back inside. Then he stood to his hunched fullest, took the bucket by its handle, and began to make his way back into the woods. I stayed by the tree until he turned, said something, not a word I knew or know, then gestured with a forward sweep of his hand. At first I didn't comply, despite knowing he wanted me to follow. After a few moments, he yipped, clicked his teeth, and gestured again, more emphatically. With this further prompt, I did get up and come along, the man making approval noises and putting on his smile again. We went into the woods. The man led, but he was naturally quicker and quieter, making it hard to keep up. Eventually, he would stop when he lost me, knocking on trees with sticks and whistling arrhythmically that I might find him in the vegetation. He never came back for me, opting instead to guide me forward with noises. I became lost, having only a vague sense of my grandparents' place being behind me. After some time, maybe 15 minutes, we came to a bald. The man had me wait there, indicated by patting the ground, before going off into the tree line alone. He returned from a different direction, pulling a sled. It was made from half of discarded plastic drum and lined with small pelts and smooth bark. On the back half rested the fly-covered carcasses of squirrels, possums, and other critters savaged into anonymity. On the pulling end, woven pouches were tied into place on it by the same cordage that made the man's necklace. He put my bucket on the sled and tossed Ghidorah in the pouch. Then he called me closer with a glottal noise and beckoning wave. I saw the sled's pouches held many odds and ends. Dried salamanders, mushrooms, metal bits, glass fragments. From one, the man pulled a square made from bound together sticks, just big enough to slip over my wrist. From another, he pulled a piece of fool's gold and a small shard of geode crusted with a bit of purple crystal. Then he handed it to me with the air of business and a few more utterings of nonsense. He then patted the ground for me to sit again. I did so without much bewilderment, understanding we had traded the same as exchanging Pokemon cards at recess. I did not miss Ghidorah anyway, as he was a bad guy. The bucket was a loss. In retrospect, I think Ghidorah was chosen because its dull gold scales resembled something valuable. The bucket for its obvious ability to hold things. The man came back and gestured for me to follow by slapping his thigh. And I did this readily. During the hike back, I tried to keep up and pay attention. I did so moderately well, having to be whistled over a few times. I did notice our path was not straight. The man led me one way and then another, making turns unneeded by the lay of the land. We eventually came back out by the creek, but it was a different approach than we'd left. I could hear my grandma calling for me again, not from up the hill, but from out in the field. The man would not cross the creek, but pushed me to do so. I did, but I did not go to my grandma. Instead, I crept back to the house and around to the opposite side. There I laid in the shrubs by our front door, pretending to be asleep once I was found. I swore I'd been there the whole time, and when I was sent back to my room, I placed my fool's gold crystal and charm in my bedside table for safekeeping. The next day I went back to the creek to pick up my toys. The man was not there, however, Throughout that summer, he did visit me again, to sit under the tree, throw rocks at the water, or yammer softly to himself. I would bring snacks and candy to share, and he would likewise give me stringy dried meat or honeysuckle blossoms taken from my old bucket. He seldom visited long, never splashed and whooped like he did on that first meeting. At this point, you may be wondering why I posted this to Backwoods Creepy and not Backwoods Weird but Wholesome, I guess. 
There are two more occasions I want to account. One gruesome and one awful. The eventful one occurred near the 4th of July. I had brought two boxes of bang snaps to the creek. The man was initially weary of the little fireworks, but quickly came over to appreciate their miniature pyrotechnics. He took the box I gave him gratefully, even taking the empty box, likely for the wood shavings which are excellent tender. During the use of the bang snaps, I had scared a turtle in the water and to the opposite bank. It sat there watching us from the far shore. The man, after stowing the bang snaps in the bucket, noticed that turtle. With little thought, he scooped up a smooth stone and threw it with force and accuracy into the turtle and waited over to retrieve the glider, which struggled meekly in his grasp. One leg knocked clean off. On my side of the river, he took from the bucket a new piece of stone. One side was rounded and fit into his hand. The other came into a flinty cutting edge. Working with depth experience, the man began chopping the live turtle above its neck. Pulling up on the top shell, the thing struggled and bled as it was bisected. The dome eventually coming free, the turtle dropped into its mingle its viscera with dirt and sand. The man rinsed the shell in the river and offered it to me. In wordless horror, I ran. The evening I came back, the shell itself was nowhere to be found. This experience did not deter me from going to the creek, or the man from visiting again. However, sometimes he would try to call me away from the creek with thumps and whistles. I would tell him I heard him and refused to move. On some occasions he would join me, on others he would leave. The last time we met, we were sitting under the tree sharing cow tails. From the woods, there came a whistling and the staccato knocking of a woodpecker. The man looked up and whistled back. There were a few more exchanges before he stood, collected his bucket, and beckoned me to follow. I was curious and felt comfortable with this man as a guide, so I did as he asked. He took me back to the bald, a direct path this time, periodically stopping to call or respond to the other in the wood. Waiting for us at the bald was a woman and child. The woman was dressed as the same as the man, topless, wrapped at the waist. She was dirty, with long hair and a wiry frame. The child was in a similar state, wearing a sack that went to their knees. The man sat on the ground and the woman joined him, sitting partly in his lap, but leaning forward so that her elbows rested her crossed knees. She had dark brown eyes that were fixed to me. The child would not look up. I didn't know what to do and didn't speak. The kid wiped at their nose and under all that sack and dirt, I learned it was a her. The man made a noise and drummed on the woman's bare back. And the kid looked at them, still hanging her head, hair covering her face. The woman yammered and swatted at the girl lazily. And the man, echoing her noises, slapping skin to skin once more. At this bizarre scene, the girl approached me, stopping close enough that I could smell her and hear her wheezing breath. She was thin, but not emaciated and slightly taller than me, she would have straightened up. The man and woman fussed some more. Then the girl leaned close to me and pressed her cheek to mine. Her hair was in between us, greasy and cold. She made no move to embrace me, no move at all, only pressing limply against me and breathing so loud it was all I could hear. During this time the woman had approached. She pulled the girl back by her shoulder with one hand and delivered a flurry of slaps to the crown of the girl's head. The woman then gathered the girl's hair in one hand, using the other to sweep her bangs back. The girl was then made to look at me, face bare. One side of her jaw was bulged out, smooth skin over a lemon-shaped bump. Her mouth was twisted by this deformity. Her nose faced one side as if affixed sideways and leaked a trail of clear snot. One eye bulged and was roomy, the other staringly regular. It looked at me, blank and dark brown. The woman gave the girl's head a little shake and then spat off to the side, then cooed like a dove as she smiled at me. I ran. There was commotion behind me. I think the girl was pushed to the ground and I did not look back and they did not pursue. My flight ended at my grandparents' house, my absence unnoticed. I chose not to tell anyone what happened, wanting to forget and not wanting to get in trouble. Not thinking about the girl, a couple, what was intended for me. I spent that August inside whenever I visited my grandparents. 
I begged not to be taken, claiming it was boring and lonely. Sometimes, when I sat on the porch or went from the car to the house, I'd catch a snippet of a bird call on the wind, or the distant tapping of wood, and hurry inside. My grandma could tell something was wrong, and made an effort to entertain me in town. My grandpa cared in his own way, involving me in errands he'd never had before. Eventually school started. Classes and friends eased me away from my thoughts of the dirty man or the people in the clearing. And time did the rest. I think now that all the people in the clearing were a family. But their features, white skin, brown eyes, brown hair, are common enough that they all could have been unrelated. I am sure they lived together. They knew each other's signals and signs. They used their own words. I know that the Smokies are full of tales of feral people, wild men, and superstition. I also know that they are full of people living in unlikely ways in unlikely places, and that those real people call others kin, and that the thought of chain of human connection, even a recluse living in a rundown shack is someone's somebody. I guess I'm asking if the people in my story are somebody someone, or if they are known, or if their behavior rings any bells, belays any known intention. I figured here, where the tale would not be discounted out of my hand might be the right place to ask. Hey everyone, thanks for listening if you stuck around at this point. If you haven't yet, please hit the like button, the subscribe button, and that notification bell to be notified when future episodes come out. If you have a true scary story of your own, Feel free to send it to my email or post it to my subreddit. You can stalk me on Twitter, you can stalk me on Facebook, and you can also stalk me on Instagram. All these links are below. What's going on everybody? I uh, hope you're having a great Wednesday, um, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. I don't get to do... Actually, I don't think I've ever done a feral encounter ever on my channel before. And I feel like those stories are pretty hard to find. And that dude that I found it, that wrote it on Reddit. Um, awesome story. Um, not exactly super spooky at times, but still really good. Um, obviously, that would be super. It's kind of one of those. I actually probably would have fit into the Childhood Memories episode that I did not that long ago. But whatever. Still really good story. Um, I hope to find more stories like that for you in the future. And... I think I'll probably be doing a themed episode, probably going to be a paranormal one like I spoke about last week. Here in the next few days, I got another episode I'm working on for Horrid. So if you haven't yet, make sure you please go check out that channel. <laughs> Sorry. As you know, I'm not going to edit any of this out because I don't care when it comes to the outro. Because 90% of you aren't listening anyway. But... Yeah, um, I have no idea, no, I don't think I have anything else to say. Enjoy the rest of your day. Um, I'm going to be doing a interview tonight with a channel called Dodge the Grave. Uh, seems like a really cool person. Have not really had the chance of actually meeting her yet, so, um, definitely look out for that on her channel. I'll, um, probably talk about it more in the next couple of days and stuff like that and leave the link and everything like that too so look out for that if you want to if you don't don't really care your choice obviously and um yeah i think that is it i will see you guys in the next one cheers